All right, we are back for another episode, and it's very exciting. Today we get to talk about hitting. Uh, you know, this is a first, which is disturbing, I guess, at this point, uh, kind of crazy. So I am joined this week by Kalia, who is our other hitting coach at OGX. Um, so kind of the fun of us traveling the country doing pitching assessments is that we get to have fun new guests and, uh, you know, talk about new topics. So, okay, maybe just start by introing yourself, sort of like, you know, where did you play? It doesn't have to be the whole spiel, but how did you end up at OGX, that sort of background? Yeah, I grew up in Southern California, Thousand Oaks specifically, played travel ball out there, got recruited to play at Bradley University, played there from 2016 till COVID. After COVID, I ended up joining staff for a couple of years, um, learned a lot there. And then after those couple of years, I ended up finding the internship at OGX. And from then on, I've been here and loving it. So it's been a great time. Yeah. Almost, almost, uh, we are what, eight? Well, no, it's 31 days in August. I don't know. A little over a week away from your first year anniversary at OGX. So uh, that is exciting. Um, So good segue into maybe my first question for you, which is, what is, you know, one or a couple, like, what are your, like, biggest areas of growth or, like, adjustments you had to make, things that surprised you about the transition from playing to coaching in college to coming into more of, like, a player development type space when it comes to hitting, I guess. And we do everything, so maybe it won't be a hitting answer, but when it comes to hitting. Yeah, I definitely think – um a lot of the hard parts for me were being able to say, I have no idea. Let me go find out. Let me go ask slowing down. And it's not always about having the answers immediately, especially with having data and things like that, knowing that you can slow down and be able to think things through a little bit more, try different things. Um, Cause at the end of the day, it's not about us. It's about the athletes. Mm-hmm. So I think, Like I came from a little bit of like a a lesson mindset too, where it's like each of your kids are you, it reflects on you. It's, it is that, but at the end of the day, it's about the kids being on the field. So taking myself out of that and letting the kids lead a little bit more has probably been the biggest transition for me. Yeah. I like that idea of like slowing down. I remember when we structure things a little bit more like lesson based, the sort of uh, pressure you felt to like in each session have some sort of like epiphany or breakthrough or, you know, like it's, you know, it's this 30 minute time block that we're going to accomplish. We're going to do all the things. And I think it, I remember it feeling very like fake um, without really understanding why it felt fake when I did that. And then also when it wasn't, translating because you had that pressure for it to be in that moment and they would be like well this it didn't really work in the game and you would be like yeah but that's just because you're not like doing it in the game like you're doing it here but like it was definitely created like a very weird dynamic so I like that phrase of slowing it down which is not like you know I think there's been um and I think Ashley and I've talked about this on various like podcasts and things but I think there was our first phase, which is like movement first. And it was almost like we went probably too slow. Like you have to be able to do everything before you can do anything. And I don't, I think we've evolved by the time you started at OGX, I think we had evolved a bit from that mindset. So I think it's definitely like, you're still making progress really fast, but it's not necessarily in a single session or with a single drill or with like the answer. It's this sort of like, we're standing side by side and we're, figuring it out together and we have some really good educated ideas of how we're going to get there and what it's going to look like. And a lot of times those are, you know, right or the general path, but sometimes they're not. And we're like willing to admit that, um, for sure. On that, like, yeah, what was the, the... Kids come in and they suck, they have a day yeah. and they suck. So I think it's, yeah. it's interesting telling athletes like we're, what we're doing is hard. Right. Yeah. Well, and sometimes you're going to have a game where you come in and you, stink and everyone at every level of the game has that so I think it's just like being okay with that I was just talking to one of our athletes on earlier this week and 
she had just started, you know, she's always lifted, but she just started lifting at our facility. And uh, so this is the first time that she's gone, walked in, did a lift and then come over to hit, you know, cause that's kind of the order they're going right now. And she just wasn't, she didn't have a great day. She was just like, couldn't really like feel her body or orient. And I said, you know, this is your first week of lifting before this, like you're tired. And she was like, I don't really feel like tired. I just haven't adjusted. And I'm like, well, that's tight. Ty- that's fatigue. You know, like, so I think it's one understanding what fatigue is, but then, you know, I said, if you had had today and it was just like, there was no reason, like it just out of the blue, you had a day like today where you were totally off. That also could happen. And that might feel a little scarier because it's like, where did that come from? And where are we going to go with this? But when there's a reason for it, and I think this goes back to the like going slow concept, like there was a reason for it. It doesn't mean that was a useless workout because also like you're going to have days where you played multiple games that day or like something where your body's off and you have to work through it. But it's also like, it's not scary. Just give your body like a minute to adjust to like the new schedule. Um, And I think that's, it's a really powerful, like, okay, you know, like I don't have to just freak out every time something goes bad, either as a coach or as a person, you know, player on both sides. Um, What is one thing on that note? Like, uh, was there anything from a, like more specifically, whether it came from like biomechanics, drills, goals, data, I don't know, you know, any space like that, like a more specific thing that you feel like either contradicted some of the things that you've thought in the past as you really dove into it, or was just maybe didn't contradict things, but it was like really something different than the way you've thought about it before since you started? Yeah, I think the hardest thing for me to swallow was the whole style concept. I know we've talked about it a lot as a staff. But when I came in, I'm like, but how, like, what's our style? Um, Right. There is no style. The athletes, that is their style. It's them being them. And I think it goes back to, like, the kids don't need you to be the face of them. Um, When Mm -hmm. the kids are working hard, that's their style. That Everyone's going to be moving different. Everyone's going to look different. When we're trying to compare people to the best people in our game. Yes, it helps sometimes, but at the end of the day, each kid is going to be their own. That was very hard for me to swallow at first, but um, yeah, it works. So right. use athletes yeah. to their best capabilities. Right. Yeah, for sure. And I think you're always trying to like, there's certain parameters of course that we talk about and things we're trying to accomplish in the swing generally. But I always say like, and when we go to look at assessments and we're like, okay, this is a, you know, this kid's slotting too early or her arms going through or whatever. I always say, uh, you know, when we're talking to the athletes, a lot of times I'll be like, you'll probably always do this a little bit and maybe even a little bit more than we want to do it once, whatever that means, or, or is like efficient because this is at least right now in the stage you're in and, and maybe for quite a bit is going to be the way your body organizes. And so we're just trying to get a little bit more out of it or delay that slot a little bit. And sometimes we've seen athletes, certainly that have made like massive change to that in that process. But sometimes it's just like adjusting their timing just a little bit makes them maximize themselves a ton. Is it the most efficient move? No, you know, like, so I think that there's just this concept of like, we get so you know, we get so much exposure to like, here's a before and after of a kid that gains 40 pounds and looks totally different and does everything different. And his swing or her swing is totally different. And that's not usually reality of people's journey. It's like you may, you can make a ton, a ton of change by cleaning up some things a little bit, changing the timing just a little bit. Um, and, you know, we see a lot of progress, but we don't have necessarily this, like, look at this insane before and after where you look totally different. You know, I think that's just not so realistic um, to most people's journey. So I think that's a good one. Yeah. Um, okay. On that concept, coming into this, what is something that you feel like now, having been, you know, through this experience for a while and watched kids kind of go through this process, is something that's overrated and hitting, whether that's a drill, an approach, a mindset, like, you know, 
it could be very specific or very broad. What is something that you feel like is kind of like the most overrated thing in hitting? Yeah, I think like the whole concept of the kinetic chain. So anything that is going against that, like kids starting in a slot and then going to contact or swinging all the way through. And we're like, yay, we made the adjustment when we start at slot. But when we go to full, right. we're going to continuously say drop our hands. Um, kids right. come in every day and they drop their hands. But when we start and stop the swing like that, we're not taking into account the kinetic chain, how er energy moves. We're not going to be able to make adjustments when we go full speed. Um, yes. Yeah. They, they always want to come in and do it because it feels comfortable. They're able to feel those things. But grand scheme of things, 99% of the time, it doesn't translate. So. Yeah. Yeah. I think even in addition to the fact that like, it doesn't translate from a adjustment of the swing. Like we just don't see that work. It's like when you do swings where you're like, okay, you pull off the ball. So now we do, we stop it, stop a lot more as feedback for the kids of like, you see the direction your body was going and, you know, we'll do that all off the machine, but like a force stop at extension because they, they aren't going through the ball or something. And that's your fix for it it almost never translates full. I think that's right. And I also think there's the idea of like, what does, what does that now that you know what we know have to do with hitting? Like there's this the element of like hitting is you can't take away. We talk about this on the pitching side all the time. We talk about everything, but like you can't take away the actual skill you're trying to do and the measurement of like, are you able to do that skill from the, mechanics changes you're making so it's like so much of hitting instruction you know and in, in the past has been about like these really broken down drills on t sometimes on front toss and what we see when kids come in assessments often is like even when they're sometimes it's like their mechanics are you know mechanics their whatever swing patterns are really inefficient and sometimes they're not that inefficient, but they are just like, you got one thing. You just go to one spot over and over and over because your training hasn't been variable. And so it's like, okay, with my eyeballs, I'm like, well, okay. She doesn't like drop her hands too much. She doesn't, all the buzzwords, you know, she doesn't pull off the ball too much, but it's like, yeah, but if I throw her anything besides front toss down the middle, she can't touch it. Because she hasn't been trained or created any ability to be variable in her swing. So I also think the reality of, like, it's kind of twofold with what you're saying, which is breaking the swing down into pieces like that, one, in, in many cases, doesn't translate the way you think it is going to. And then two, and maybe more dangerous, is that sometimes it does. <laughs> like, sometimes it does have the impact you want, but you've you pulled it so far away from the actual reality of what hitting is that it's like, was that a good fix? You know, like, was that a good fix? Can that kid now hit better? Whatever, you know, whatever that means based on what you've like made them because you've made them look better with your eye, but, you know? So I think that there's, I feel like so much, of our time is spent on creating adjustability. I mean, I, I, I would say, yes, you want to hit the ball really hard. And so there's this idea of creating power for us. Most of the time, I don't, we do sometimes we see kids that have really high power and like, it's not showing an exit velocity. So that, that short, you know, I would say that happens, but I think that's the minority of cases. Most of the time they're working on building power sort of outside of hitting, you know, and getting it into hitting. And what we are really spending our time working on is, is being adjustable. And, and so I think this idea of like, let me create this like nice looking robot is in addition to, will that really work? Is like, is that really hitting? Right? Like, is that really hitting? Right. Yeah. And they have to think um, so much about those adjustments too. When they get game, it goes out the window. Right. They're just trying to hit the ball. Yeah. Right. Well, and it's like, okay, don't drop your hands, but like, okay, here comes a drop ball with real breakdown. Is that what we're saying? You know, like I literally had a conversation this summer with Katie Stewart about like, you get, there's a certain part that that ball gets to where you have to drop your hands. Like you have to let your hands go. What you're deciding is like, what it, you know, when you're practicing it, when you're seeing, 
a ball at different heights with break and you're you're practicing the level of variability that is appropriate for your level and your skill and and the types of things that we take into consideration you start to learn okay what is what does it feel like to get to that pitch you know like when do i let go of my hands just to make contact because it's o2 and this is the kid you know this is the pitch the kid throws or whatever that looks like you start to feel that this idea of like having the same swing on everything like that's i mean think about what we see on like twitter you know someone has some insane swing that ends up being a home run or something you know like so i just think that's this is not hitting it's not hitting um yeah okay what about what is what do you feel like is underrated like what is something that you didn't necessarily value or people didn't value coming you know from a hitting standpoint coming into your work here that you're like oh that that was really underrated yeah i think like just the simplicity of like differently weighted bats i know i used one when i was growing up but it was like probably seven pounds or something ridiculous but just like (laughs) being able to swing bats that are weighted differently like weighted in the handle weighted in the barrel like those micro adjustments that the kids don't even need to think about um i mean especially with our long bat it's so easy just to throw those in even if you're not doing drills or start types or things like that adding those in is huge mm-hmm. yeah and i think it goes to the same concept of what we were talking about before which is the need for these kids to face variability right so it's like Okay, when we're saying variability, adjustability, it really gets a heart of, you have a lot of athletes at this point where they swing all the time. And that may be one of the main things they do. They hopefully lift, but they might not play another sport. They, you know, there's a, so they're limited in their sort of like movements, adjustability. And so we will, often see athletes you know kind of stuck in one swing and you know as we've sort of alluded to there's a variety of things like we could be it's inefficient so we need to go after it it's a little inefficient so maybe we're not like going after it too much but we're trying to get it to vary to different heights to different locations to different break to different timing obviously is the massive thing with hitting and so the bats create some variability um they create some like feedback for the athletes without having to like break them down as we're talking about in ways that really don't necessarily translate. And it helps them to seek their own kind of solution from that. So we typically use at OGX the Axe uh, Overload Bats, which I don't think they're selling right now, um, which is a shame. So hopefully uh, that comes back on the market, but they're about 10% heavier. There's the handle load and the barrel load. Um, So the weight is kind of, in different places. And then we also use the long bat, which we helped create with X, which is 37, 29. So that's mostly our high school athletes that use that, um, high school and college and professional. Um, it's a little heavy for some of our middle schoolers, but the like length of that obviously gives them some really good feedback for when they're inefficient to the ball or, or how, you know, they have to be a little more direct to the ball or they have to be a little cleaner in their rotation to get the barrel. And when they don't, They don't hit it good. And obviously that gives you feedback of not liking the feeling of not hitting a ball good. Um, So I think those are great. I think that that's really true. Um, I would say when I was thinking about this question of like what the most underrated thing is, I think this is even true of like my own evolution even recently. But I think one of the most underrated things is talking about timing in a like meaningful way. Um, and really working through kids feeling like they are in control of timing and they know what the hell that means when you say that, like what, what is timing? How do I create timing? Because I think it's not that I don't think we've talked about timing, but I think we've always said like, you're late, you're early. Like it's been very simple. And so what happens is when you tell someone they're late, they just start everything sooner. And when you tell someone they're early, they just wait and start everything later. And sometimes that's the right correction, but often it's not. And so I think one of the things that has been really beneficial that we've 
really like worked lately to do is it describe to the athlete, both based on them and based on kind of what is happening. Like, what does it mean to be early and late? Because ultimately we're talking about the barrel, the thing that it's, it's not never, not never. There's sometimes that you just get blown up. Right. And you're just like, everything's late and you just can't get there in time. Um, or, everything's early or whatever, but oftentimes it's about getting the barrel where you need to get it on. Not often. It's always about getting the barrel where you need to on time. And often we see in our athletes that when they don't understand the connection of like their body and the barrel. Right. And so it's like when they, when they think that being on time is just about like when they just go as a blob instead of understanding kind of controlling their body in order to control the barrel that concept when they can start to understand that it's really, I think it unlocks like a lot of things. I think it unlocks being in, just feeling like you're more in control of an at bat because you have a lot of options for how to waste things for how to, you know, make certain things happen. Uh, feeling like you can kind of like sell out at certain times because you do feel more in control later. Like, I think there's a lot of things people can do. I think it's why the sort of like, we often see when kids start with us and they haven't faced machine a lot, everyone freaks out, right? Because they do terrible on the machine to start because two things happen. It's variable in the break in some ways. It's not like we put it on like heavy break, but it's breaking different. It has different locations. So it's more variable than front toss. And it's variable to some degree, you know, because it fluctuates a little bit depending on the ball and different things on speed. And so we've sort of fed variability onto the athletes and that is hard for them when they've not trained it. So I think this concept of like machine and really working through timing on machine is something that is like wildly underrated. And I think that what you're saying about the bats is the basis of being able to do that. So I think it's it's similar concept, but like if I can't, you know, switch bats or have variability from a sort of body standpoint. And then I come and I'm on the machine and something like that. And can I, or live, and can I understand what variability looks like there, adjustability looks like there, and being in control of that. Um, I just think that that's, we want to like feed them. So it's like, how many times have you heard athletes? They'll be like, was I under that? Was I over it? Was I late? Was I early? And I think our job is like hopefully getting them to a place where they can answer that themselves um, and then make the adjustment themselves. Yeah. And like even our reset a lot of the time on the machine work is be late, take it to the opposite field dugout. Like that is so right. simple. And I remember the first time I heard you say that, I was like, wow, that's really all we needed to be saying. With how many years of kids being early and being on the front foot, smashing the ball into the ground just reset, be late, then we can get our barrel from it from there. But we have to start in a, like, a good posture to get to that position. It's such an easy thing. Right. Yeah, and I think the reason that Q works is because we often see that when they're early and they're smashing into the ground, it's often the same reason they're late because their their body their body is getting there so early. And then so... Their adjustment often from there is, okay, I'll just try to like hold my barrel back or my barrel ends up like dragging because then I'm pulling or whatever. So we see it like, you know, that now they hit it. Most of the kids, they can only hit it right center. So they hit it right center or they roll over because they actually like release early or whatever. And so a lot of times the focus on being not like just take it off though, because I think sometimes that generically can be not a good cue, but like literally hit it as hard as possible into the first base dugout makes their body, they go later with everything. And then typically like our next cue after a couple of that is keep your body the same, but now try to hit up the middle. And so this feeling of like, still go that late with your body, but let the barrel release at the last second, you know, like try to actually get it. And it allows them to work through different timing of like actually segmenting and, and adjusting their timing. And it's this like simple concept, but it's just something that athletes don't, think a lot about I mean we have athletes where I was like either they said was I late or I said you know how did you feel with timing and the ball went 
like, you know, was like to the opposite side, flared back, and they were like, early. I'm like, early? You know, so I think there's just an element of like, you, you have to teach them what everything is telling them. And I think that's a big, when I say, you know, I think that's right on track with what I'm saying about timing, which is like, we're trying to teach them what the feedback is telling them. Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, what, what has been something that you think like, okay, this is sort of my next area. Like if I'm thinking about where I'm going to keep growing as a hitting coach, um, or where like, we're going to keep growing, where do you feel like is some of the areas you're trying to like really dive into next or, or even we're trying to dive in next? Cause obviously we're working on a lot of stuff at OGX too. Yeah. I think we talk a lot about it on the pitching side and I just, I keep wanting to dive into it more on the hitting side, but things that kids do that are different, that are weird, but that also make them really good at certain things. Like we have a kid with early um, wrist flexion. So she's going to be good on the lower half of the zone, upper half if she's going to struggle. So it's not like we can take that away from her because it's all she has right now. So I think diving into that stuff a little bit more, um, it's technical, it's hard. So I just, I really think that stuff is super interesting. Um, I don't want to like yeah. dominate an athlete's ability to get to the ball. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. It's like, as you're trying to create adjustability on a kid, which we, which we have to, um, what is, cause we had, a, we had a college athlete like this, like two summers ago, your internship summer where. I was talking to the college and she had kind of a minimal role hitting, um, which made sense in some ways. Her adjustability was not there. She had a ton of power and was like definitely based on her swing and up ball kid. And I said that and the coaches were like, oh yeah, she does really match like rise ball kids are up. And it's like, wouldn't we all love that? Because that's not often what people could do. And so I think that's, that's, it's a really interesting point. And one, I don't think we've, fully dove into enough to like really speak to it. But I think what I said, but I is like, why can't you be a pinch hitter then in those scenarios? Like, why wouldn't you put her in, in those scenarios, you know, uh, when, the, when you're facing a hitter or a pitcher like that in those moments, could she really own that part of her, you know? Um, and I, and maybe that's not a role someone wants all the time, but if that is her role, you know, it was her role going into that summer was a pinch hitter. Isn't it an even better role if you understand what kind of pitching she's going to hit? Um, and I think this, that kind of plays into what I think is like our next big thing, which is pitch shapes. We started talking about this a little bit, but like, um, I think as there's more in-game data, uh, we dove into this a little bit with some of our college um, athletes, except they were going based on, the I think six four three like charts and and spray charts and things like that. So it was like rise ball. It was pitch labels and then locations and things like that. Um, which obviously is is it's not nothing. Um, and it's helpful to kind of see their zones and and where they hit well. Um, but we have started talking a lot about like, but what was that pitch actually doing? You know, because we know that like something labeled a rise ball doesn't, you know, there's lots of variations of that. It could be an up pitch with sink. It could be an up bullet pitch. It could be an actual backspin pitch. And so, you know, you're prepping at the highest level of hitter. You're prepping those hitters to be able to see that variety. You know, a drop ball could be a down pitch with bullet, an actual sink pitch. And then sink pitch means a lot of things, right? You could have just a little bit of sink. You could have a lot of sink. And so, what are you trying to match with the barrel? I think we've done some inferring at OGX, some pretty like smart, educated inferring, but of what we're like prepping our athletes for um, from a break direction. But I think that that is like a very interesting thing. I think sometimes like we put our machines on like curveball or drop ball to prep for things. I think there's something to like, what is the actual spin this machine is? throwing and what are we trying to prep the athletes for and 
that type of thing. I've, you know, we've done backspin a long time at OGX. It's a main part of a lot of our programming, whether it's a drill, um, which it often is just a drill to create some variability or, you know, some of our older athletes use it to prep for facing backspin. Um, and I still coach this summer and we faced like a kind of, a, a you know, we've all kind of seen it like a weird, but effective backspin kid. And because most of the kids on my team had faced that, I was like, it's just like the machine. It is the, it is the machine. And no matter what height she throws you, cause it was a kid that only had access to that, whatever height she throws you, it's, it's that. And we just matched this kid, like, because they had practiced that variability. They've practiced that spin you know, profile. And so they felt very confident in like what it meant to match a plane like that. Um, and I think that that is the next concept, you know, you and I have talked about this and this, I actually have talked a little bit on the podcast with, but like when the athletes give each other feedback, they also talk in like pitch labels, you know, they're like, she throws a curve and a drop and a rise. and like, she didn't throw any of that. Like, so we've started, talking a little bit with our higher level athletes about, okay, most pitchers have a little arm side run or sorry, not arm side run, a little glove side run and a little down. That's what most people throw. Just sort of, that's the average, you know, spin direction. And so your feedback is more about like, what did it do off of? Was it different than that? You know, was it different than that? And so um, I think that's the interesting like next chapter. And I think, the more we can see in-game data and kind of see what it looks like, you know, even getting to like release at certain points, like where is it getting released from? Um, you know, where is it? We have lefties that kind of seem to like step across and like, where are they releasing it from? And that type of thing, I think is, is an interesting next level of variability that the athletes have to prep for. And we have the tools to help them prep for it. If we're just like a little smarter with it. Definitely. What did your like variability training look like when you played? Did you do machine? We did machine. We did machine a lot. You did machine at Bradley because um, you had low teeth. You had low teeth heritage in your family. <laughs> yes, we have the blood. So, um, mm-hmm. but we would do like a screwball day. One plate's really far in. One plate's on the corner. Stuff like that, and a lot of it like you have to keep pushing yourself um Mm -hmm. we didn't do too much tea which i'm not i when i was playing i was not a fan of the tea i want to see ball moving um right so we didn't do too much of that i mean we swung a heavy bat we were really aggressive we had hard takes um variability wise i think it was just like what we could give ourselves for sure Mm -hmm. so yeah yeah yeah, interesting. All right, well, a full day of hitting. What a day. It's uh, not very often I get to only talk about hitting. So uh, it was a good first hitting and probably not the last one for the next few weeks because all the pitching people are traveling and, you know, doing assessing our hundreds of pitchers. So as we help make the pitchers better, we also have to make sure we are ready to hit. So these are the conversations as OGX helps uh, – infiltrate the pitching world we better be right behind it with the hitting world that we're going to be uh goners as they start to get the pitchers to have more and more weird variability and uh and we're all swinging off front toss that's probably not going to be a good matchup so we better make sure we're, we're ready for it so yeah all right well thank you for being on and uh it will be a surprise who everyone sees next week's a little uh, toss up here every week to see who we can get on and what it looks like so until next week